Hello everyone, we hope you're doing well. Welcome to Bread and Roses. I'm Aram Namazi. And I'm Farid Bospuya. In this week's program, we're going to be talking about Hassan Rouhani's speech at the UN General Assembly. <laughs> he, he was <laughs> speaking quite a bit like a robot and he had some very interesting not things to say. A lot of uh, falsehood and, and not exactly facts, but it, hey, who cares? It's, it's uh, <laughs> UN General Assembly and Fingos. <laughs> From Trump to Rouhani and, and like, the rest of them, yeah. uh, just lie after lie, wasn't yeah. it? Interview this week is with Brian Earp, the Associate Professor uh, of Yale uh, Hastings Programme on Ethics and Health. Um, he has a very interesting uh, things to say about circumcision of mm. children, uh, the issue of ethics and the negative health impact and how, uh, you know, uh, made up arguments to justify circumcision of children. Very interesting. We'll watch this together. Stay with us. Don't go away. Hassan Rouhani, the president of the Islamic Republic of Iran, was at the UN General Assembly recently and his speech was just, first of all, so robotic and also so full of lies that honestly my horns have not gone down yet. It's just unbelievable how anyone can lie in broad daylight. Well, I guess we're used to Trump and Boris Johnson. Well, we've got another one here, the Islamic regime of Iran's representative, lying through its teeth about the situation. And it's At the outset, I would like to commemorate the freedom-seeking movement of Hossein, peace be upon him, and pay homage to all the freedom seekers of the world who do not bow to oppression and aggression and tolerate all the hardship of the struggle for rights as well as to the spirits of all the oppressed martyrs of terrorist strikes and bombardments in Yemen, Syria, occupied Palestine, Afghanistan, and other countries of the world, including Iraq. And it's interesting because the Iranian regime always talks about how foreign agents are intervening, foreign agents should never intervene into the, the business of Iran. And all it does is talk about people everywhere except the people in Iran. People, it says the innocent people of Palestine, of Iraq, of Afghanistan, of, of Yemen, of Syria, everywhere. And it says that it's the one that's protecting them, defending them vis-a-vis -vis the big old bad America. And, he, and, and they're the ones who bring in peace and, and, and security for people. Just, just take a moment for a second. In the last 40 years in Iran, have Iranian people had any moment of peace? and security. Hmm. I mean, look at the places that he recounts in his speech, uh, Yemen, Syria, uh, Palestine, Iraq, Afghanistan. Have the, since the Islamic Republic of Iran has entered in those scenes, have people have had a moment of peace and tranquility? No. I mean, that's Ladies and gentlemen, we in Iran, despite all of the obstructions created by the U.S. government, are keeping on the path of economic and social growth and prosperity. Iran's economy in 2017 registered the highest economic growth rate in the world. And today, despite fluctuations emanating from foreign interference, in the past one and a half years, we have returned to the track of growth and stability. It's amazing how Rouhani in his speech could refer to Iran as a top performing economic uh, country in the world in 2017. A country which, is ha which has over 40% inflation. 
and they gr compared to that growth rate of 2.8 percent i mean compare the 2.8 percent with over 40 percent inflation that means negative impact on people's lives and we see that the, the effect of our day, daily lives of the iranian people and he could go and stand in front of the general assembly and claim iran has the best performing uh, um, uh, economic activity i mean in come 2017 on. i mean is, is, is that possible uh, how can he lie through his teeth of course the united states militarism is a very bleak, negative, brutal, repressive force in the Middle East. It is one aspect of state terrorism in the region. But so is the Islamic regime of Iran. It's not as if, uh, you know, uh, America bad, Islamic regime good. Uh, they're both bad. They're both negative forces. And if there is anything that brings hope to that region to uh, that country, Iran, it is a people's own movement against uh, all of it. It is astonishing that they have, just give, let me give you an example, they have so many dual nationals uh, uh, in, in prison in Iran and they're actually the hostages. Uh, um, openly, Zarif, the foreign minister of the Islamic regime, uh, talks about exchanging them for, for money, 400,000 uh, uh, pounds was supposed to be exchanged uh, and and uh, Britain did not agree to pay that and did, and said we are, we are ready to deal and exchange prisoners and hostages that's what it is the Islamic regime of Iran is a, a bunch of criminals hostage takers and the United Nations is a scene for them to do some deals on exchanging hostages and prisoners I think what's very clear from looking at the speeches of the representatives of various countries whether it's Iran whether it's the US or European countries, they don't care an iota about the situation of people uh, in Iran or the Middle East. Look, they are there to promote their own political and economic interests. Boris Johnson invited Rouhani to come uh, to visit the United Kingdom, for example. They don't care that there are dual nationals in prison. They don't care that women's rights campaigners uh, and labor rights activists and environmental activists have been given decades long prison sentences merely for fighting for their rights. People are being hung in city squares. They don't care about that. And I think what's very clear is that the solution doesn't lie in the wheelings and dealings of these governments in the UN corridors. It lies in people's movements for change. And I think we see a very strong um, movement in Iran in particular against this regime. And, it, and that's what really brings hope, uh, you know, the Iranian regime is the opposite of hope. It's the opposite of progress. So, Brian Erb, it's such a pleasure to have you on our program. I wanted to speak to you about male circumcision. I recently heard you speak at a conference at the National Secular Society and it was a stunning speech. Oh, thanks. Um, I suppose the first thing I'd like to ask you is, uh, you know, if it's really harmful, I mean, a lot of people will say it's not very harmful, it's actually got very positive effects. Mm -hmm. And just recently in Iran, a seven-month-old baby died as a result of it. So. Tell us a bit about the harm related to this and how um, prevalent it is for, for children to be hurt as a result. Sure. The first thing to do is to figure out what kinds of harm there can be. So one harm that most people recognize is just the experience of pain. And I think one people get around this with the male circumcision issue is that they used to think at least that little babies didn't feel pain or maybe, well, they feel other sorts of pain. They just went through this traumatic process. So what's a little extra trauma? Um, we now know that uh, infants, if anything, experience pain more acutely than adults do because of where they are in their neurodevelopment. Also, adults can anticipate that the pain will end at some point, whereas for a baby, they don't know what's going on. And so if you're born, you're just brought into the world, and you have indeed just gone through a rather traumatic process to be born. We normally take great care to protect children as soon as we bring them into the world. We put them in very soft blankets and we, you know, apologize to them every time we have to give a little vaccination or a heel prick to draw blood. But then there's this funny blind spot where I think mostly because parents don't know what's happening, they don't watch it, uh, at least in, in my country, in the United States, it's done down the hallway. But if parents knew what was happening, the first step is you 
lay the baby into a, a device called a circumstraint. And this is where you strap all four of their limbs down so they can't move. Some doctors will use pain control, other doctors won't. But even the most effective form of pain control doesn't have a, a perfect uh, success rate. Also, it's very painful to administer. It's injected through a large needle several times into the base of the penis. So once that sets in, there's relatively less pain control, but some parts of the surgery are so severe that it cuts right through the, the analgesis. So uh, the, the first step of a circumcision is to detach the foreskin from the head of the penis. And at birth, many people, again, don't know this because if it happened to them, it was before they were conscious. But uh, there's a membrane connecting this tissue like the way that your fingernail is connected to your finger. And in both cases, there's a protective purpose being served. So your fingernail protects your finger when you uh, go out and reach for things. And the foreskin is protecting the head of the penis, which is normally an internal organ like your eye is. Your eye is protected by a, a, a lid of uh, tissue that has a mucous membrane underneath. The same thing is true of the foreskin. And what it's doing is keeping contaminants out and away from the urethral opening. And it's not meant to be retracted for the first several years of life at least. So if you want to get those structures apart, you just have to use a blunt probe. So what doctors do is they'll clip the opening of the foreskin, they'll stretch it open, they'll take a, a probe and insert it between those structures, just like imagining putting something between your fingernail and the bed of your finger. I mean, that's just a form of torture, of course, in some settings. They'll, you, you put a sharp object between those things because it hurts a lot. And so that hurts a lot for the baby. Uh, the other thing is that this creates a, a tearing and a wound on the head of the penis. So even when they've done the rest of the procedure and they've uh, applied a clamp to cut off the blood supply and then they cut the tissue all the way off, now what you have is an open wound that you've created. And so it's not just the pain during the surgery that is a, a form of harm, but also now this wound is in a diaper for uh, you know a week or two while it's healing, being exposed to urine and feces. And that too is excruciating. I mean, imagine getting urine on an open wound. So there's a whole bunch of ongoing pain that's associated with this for the child. Another way to think about harm is just the loss of something valuable. So in the United States, where I'm from, uh, the medical establishment generally doesn't consider that there may be value to the tissue that's removed. Because it's been such a long-term cultural practice, most of the male doctors themselves don't have foreskins and lost them when they were infants. And most of the female doctors mostly know other men who don't have this tissue. So it's very easy in that cultural context to just assume it's you know a little bit of skin or something without value. But again, in cultures where you know, genital cutting of children is not uh, commonly pursued, it's taken as obvious and self-evident that this is erogenous tissue. It's very sensitive tissue. In fact, there are a couple of studies showing that the foreskin itself is the most light touch sensitive tissue uh, anywhere on the penis. So what you're doing is removing the most delicate and finely acutely sensitive tissue. And if you assign that value, as you presumably would to any other healthy part of the body, then simply removing it is a harm because you've lost something of value. So there's a tendency, I think, in cultures where this tissue is routinely removed to trivialize it, but it's often done very ignorantly. Most of the people who say, well, the foreskin is just a flap of skin, they really don't know what they're talking about. They haven't, you know, they don't have a foreskin, they haven't done much research about it. And once they do, uh, many people suddenly feel rather aggrieved and they say, well, wait a minute, I, I didn't realize that was tissue that had value or I didn't realize this was done when I couldn't say no. And then sometimes they'll feel rather harmed retrospectively. So, I mean, what do you say to people who say that it's, uh, it's got positive health benefits to do something like that to your son? Sure. Um, Removing any tissue from the body will have some sort of health benefit in that that tissue can't become infected and it can't be a, a host or a vector for other kinds of disease. Uh, and they used to do routine removal of tonsils for that reason, but they no longer do that because they realize that whatever health benefits you get from something have to be countered by the risks of doing surgery. And so now the prevailing view in medical ethics is that surgery should be the last resort and it should only be done when there's an extant problem. You wouldn't just perform surgery on a healthy child thinking that maybe later that tissue might become subject to some problem because you could remove all parts of the body for that reason. You know, breasts may develop breast cancer, but you wait until you see that the person uh, either has a very high risk and can consent to prophylactic removal uh, or until you detect cancer. But you wouldn't just indiscriminately remove breast tissue from healthy girls, certainly not without their consent. Similarly, you know, the labia can become infected and can host uh, various problems, but no one would just preemptively remove the labia. I mean, some cultures do. And in those cultures, the, the doctors similarly, you know, uh, attribute these health benefits to it because it kind of 
makes it add up a little bit better. If you've been routinely removing healthy erogenous functional tissue from a child's body without consent, and when that's the sort of thing that modern medical ethics strictly forbids in every other case, you've got to come up with some justification for it. And so in every culture you find this appeal to supposed health benefits. But just take, take one example to show how absurd the argument is. It's regularly said that urinary tract infections are less common in boys that have been circumcised than those who haven't been. And so parents say, well, I wouldn't want them to get a urinary tract infection. But the absolute risk of getting a UTI in boys is about 1%. It's 10 times less frequent than it is for girls after the age of one. And in girls, you just treat the infection. You don't preemptively remove tissue in case they get an infection. And so it's so rare that you would have to perform more than 100 circumcisions to prevent one treatable urinary tract infection. And so when you put it in those terms, when you just make a vague appeal to health benefits, when you look at the actual data and, you know, the fact that these benefits can be achieved in other ways that are less invasive, surgery should be a last resort, not a, not a first resort for uh, supposedly bringing these health benefits. I mean, you mentioned choice and, uh, you know, um, the child not having that option to choose. But there are many instances where children don't have an option to choose. The parents choose for them because they're their guardians. Sure. Why would this be any different than, you know, parents choosing to send their kids to school or choosing not to let them smoke and that sort of thing? These examples are nicely unified in that they promote the child's future autonomy. So to fail to send your child to any kind of school would be to prevent them from functioning as an autonomous adult in a complex cultural environment where they need to have those skills and they need to develop them from a young age. Similarly, prohibiting them from smoking is doing the same thing. It's preserving their bodily health into the future so that when they become autonomous, they'll have uh, you know, a, a more functional uh, bodily system to then make their own decisions in, about. So circumcising is the opposite logic. It's removing a choice that they could have had in the future with respect to their genitals. So it's true that generally speaking, parents are entitled to make decisions about the care and upbringing of their children, but they don't of course have a blank check to do just whatever to their children's bodies. There are very clear lines that society draws around what can be done to a child's body precisely because the child is so vulnerable and doesn't have any way of defending themselves. So for example, you can't tattoo a child in pretty much any Western jurisdiction. And this leads to absurd consequences. You can't tattoo your son's foreskin because you would be arrested, at least in many US states, it would be considered child abuse to do that. But if you want to just cut his foreskin off altogether and then go tattoo it over here, currently that's considered permissible because we have this crazy blind spot when it comes to this particular genital surgery. So within the realm of things that already we agree you cannot do to children's bodies, ritual scarification, any form of female genital cutting, even a prick to the clitoral hood is considered impermissible in Western law. Circumcision is far beyond these interventions. So again, scarification. You can't scar your child's body for even deeply religious cultural traditions that have been going on for a long time. But you can create a scar around the circumference of their penis if you do a circumcision, which is exactly what it does. It creates a, a large invisible scar. So uh, it's this one-off exception to very well-settled norms that we apply without even uh, thinking twice about it to other sorts of interventions. Mm -hmm. So what about people will say that if their kids aren't circumcised, it's going to have negative effects, they'll be shunned, they won't fit in, uh, they'll lose, uh, they'll, they'll never get married, you know, you hear mm -hmm. that about both boys and girls if, if, if they're not circumcised. That's right. Yeah, so in any society that practices female genital cutting, a, a claim is that if the girl isn't cut, she won't be able to be married. And the same thing is true for the boys in the same culture. So there's no society that only cuts the girls and puts it as a condition of marriage. The boys will also be cut, and also it will be a condition of marriage. Um, the best example of this kind of problem, it's a collective action problem, is the example of foot binding in Chinese culture. So this is a overtly harmful practice that limits the mobility of girls and disfigures their feet and so forth. And it was done for thousands of years. Why? Because of this contingency whereby if you fail to do it to your daughter, then she would experience psychosocial harms. There's two things about this. First, if the community would hold a child's welfare hostage to undergoing a non-consensual, painful, harmful bodily ritual, the community has reason to change the conditions that it uses to provide welfare to the children. You should love and welcome a child regardless of whether you've subjected to them to some painful rite. Now they might decide to go through some sort of initiation ritual or something like that to show their dedication to the community, but that's something they've got to do when they're making their own decision. If you subject a little baby to a ritual, 
it's not making any kind of decision. It's just experiencing pain that it has, it can assign no meaning to. Um, the other thing is that when it's a collective action problem like this, it requires coordinated effort. So the way that Chinese foot binding ended was after thousands of years of being a necessary precondition of marriage, the elites of the society noticed the structure of the problem, which is that no individual parent can fail to do this to their daughter or she will suffer psychosocial harm. They just agreed to change the norms in one generation. So they said, we're not going to bind our daughter's feet and we're also not going to let our sons marry any girl whose feet are bound. And so after thousands of years, the tradition ended in one generation. And a similar thing I think is going to have to happen with genital cutting practices because it's a similar kind of an issue. This has played out in recent history. So in New Zealand and Australia uh, into the 1980s or so, the rate of male circumcision was very high. It was about 80 or 90 percent. And this followed from England, which is where this procedure started in the Victorian period as a way to combat masturbation. And it kind of got exported to the, to the colonies. Um, the rates slowly dropped to around 50% uh, through various reasons. People were aware that babies were dying every once in a while and thinking that's not really a tolerable risk if it's a healthy child. Um, the health benefits were seen to be exaggerated and so forth. So like any social norm, if you get below a certain threshold, suddenly it just disappears because norms only persist if everybody agrees to do them. You know, we, it's by mutual consent that money has value. It doesn't, I mean, it's just paper. It doesn't have any value. And so if people stopped treating it like it had value, it wouldn't have value. Similarly, if we stop treating circumcision like it's a, a requirement of marriage in cultures where that's true, I mean, that's typically not true in most Western countries. Um, the United States, the rate now is about 50%. So you're just as likely to be different if you're circumcised or not, uh, depending on where you are. So that argument doesn't hold water anymore. What about this concept that you raise about a child's bodily integrity? What, what do you mean by that? Yeah. Why is that important? Well, especially in Western countries, we tell children from a very young age that they have an absolute right to say no to unwanted touching or even anyone seeing their genitals. And that's because we recognize that the genitals are special, they're private, they're related to sexual identity and sexual experience. And so we think that when it comes to something so personal and so private as that, children need to know from a young age that when some adult who has more power than them wants to encroach upon their genital sphere, they should say no. Within this kind of cultural environment where you've been taught from a very young age that you have absolute dominion over your genitals, to then find out through some means or another because you meet somebody who wasn't circumcised or you travel to a culture where it's not common or you get on the internet and just do some Googling, you have to suddenly face the realization that within this cultural environment where you've been told that your body is yours and that no means no, somebody preemptively intervened in that very part of your body and permanently removed and caused a scar on uh, this very special uh, bodily part is the sort of thing that people face and have to decide what to do with. Some people realize this and then just immediately get defensive or suppress it or say, well, that's fine. There's all these health benefits and it's better anyway and who cares? And other people say, well, wait a minute. No, that should have been my choice. And the fact that that choice was taken from me in a world where all the other signs tell me that it, that it should have been my choice, I have a right to feel aggrieved. And so many people do now feel aggrieved. I mean, I mean as a final question, for people who live in Iran or places mm -hmm. where it's done and also, I mean, the government, in a sense, is Islamic or mm -hmm. a theocracy, uh, it's much more difficult, of course. I mean, what suggestions do you have for people who live in those sorts of situations on this question? Yeah. I think in societies where you have strong masculinizing norms where men are expected to be tough and strong and girls are constructed as weak and vulnerable, it can be very hard if you do notice a harm or you feel that something ought not to have been done or you do research and you realize that maybe something happened that you don't like. It's very hard to express it to anyone because you might be afraid that you'll be seen as, as vulnerable. I think a good bigger picture response to this is that Vulnerability can be a good thing, or at least the recognition of harm can be important because that allows you to make better judgments about the next generation. So it's not that any person who's been circumcised needs to go home and feel mutilated and devastated and like they have no uh, recourse. They do have a recourse in that they can make a decision about the next generation. That's one way to respond. Um, but it is a collective action problem. And so it only starts to get the norm punctured when people speak up and they raise a complaint and they don't have to do it in a way that says, um, you know, uh, I don't have any value, I don't have any pride. You can be proud of the fact that you're making a moral judgment and you're questioning a norm in your culture that deserves to be questioned. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.
Thank you.